What don't you find on the internet? There are many funny answers to this question. What's that? Let's ask Google. But interestingly enough, this question about what you don't find on the internet is something we like to call hashtag ungoogleable. And it's because you can't find what's not there, right? Um, the answer to this question is my grandpa, right? The answer to this question is the people that don't show up on the internet. And then the interesting question to that is why, right? So why? And you have, I'm going to answer that face. Ancestry.com. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I've got several great great grandparents on Ancestry.com, come to think of it. So, mm -hmm. people, oh, that is a great answer to that one. People who choose to keep their online and their real identity separate. That is very common. All right. What kinds of groups choose to keep their identities separate? What's that? Me. <laughs> I've got a couple of those too. <laughs> Um, I, th I think we all do. We've got some kind of, of anonymity and then a real identity, something like that. What does that do to split your identities like that, to make yourself not findable on the internet? It gives you more freedom. It gives you more freedom, yes. More freedom to open up to people without the risk of um, mm -hmm. your actual identity being mm -hmm. associated with it. So if you don't like somebody, you don't have to worry about the future. Mm -hmm. Online, they can find you anywhere, yes, unless you're hidden. What's that? It restricts your freedom. It does restrict your freedom. That is a very good, expand on that point, please. Um, so there's a lot of times where you need to be, have, like, people mm -hmm. won't trust you. So uh, yes. Because you're not giving your real self out there, so mm -hmm. you can't do certain things on the internet because you're not giving mm -hmm. your real identity. There's a lot of things you can't do if you split your identities that way. That's a great answer to that question. One of those things, for instance, might be send money uh, using a, a standard kind of, of application or website like PayPal, right? You have to have your real identity tied to that. Big, a lot of controversy on Facebook right now about having mm -hmm. your real identity, especially for, um, there, about six or seven months ago, there was a big push to have every drag queen on Facebook register under their real name, which was horrifying to many of the people in that, in that group because it would have exposed an identity that would have been very problematic in their everyday lives. It was still who they were, but they didn't choose to expose themselves in that fashion. Um, you had a, an answer? Mm -hmm. and credibility like LinkedIn and having credibility on LinkedIn mm -hmm. it helps with resumes. It does. Resumes. It absolutely does. One of the ways that you can tell whether or not something is real on the internet is how many real identities are behind it, are tied to it. Reputation on the internet is everything, right? So if you choose to build reputation on the internet in a different way than with your real identity, you may be losing out on some of that power. So yeah, the answer to what you don't find on the internet sometimes is reality, is sometimes people's real selves. The reason I like to talk about cognitive bias and what you don't find on the internet is because one of the most important things I see is looking at a situation and seeing what's not there. It's closely related to uh, expected utility theory in game theory. It's very much related to diversity in technology. It is hugely related to error handling, exception handling, programs, documentation, anything that should be there but isn't. It's very easy to look at it and go, I see that everything here works without necessarily asking yourself how it could be better. What is the missing piece? That is a hugely important question. It's one of the ones that really, that interests me and has for the length of my academic and personal and professional career is what you don't see there. One of the reasons why I love that work by Puking Monkey on the Moo Cow, uh, the, the tolls on the Easy Pass, he's, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And it's because he sees things that other people don't see. He sees what's not happening, what isn't there. And that is a, just an unbelievable like framing flip to look at the world in that fashion. And the more people we have like that, the better. So with this kind of question, with identity, um, I, I want to push forward into the three things we were going to talk about today, which is identities, the missing pieces, and the solutions. Okay, so we've got some identities of people that, that maybe build reputation or, or interact on the internet a little differently. People that don't want to use their real names on Facebook. People that um, need to have credibility for something, but if their credibility in one area is tied to their real identity, could really hurt them, right? Are there any other kinds of people that you think are trying to hide on the internet? FBI. Trying to be not there. FBI. 
<laughs> FBI. Trolls. trolls. That is an excellent answer to that question. Why would you hide your real identity if you were a troll? Well, so, they can say the troll mm -hmm. they so they can say whatever they want without consequences in real life? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's true. That's absolutely what it's for. I will not pretend that I haven't created fake accounts all over the internet. Right? What's that? Controversial opinions. That is a really interesting thing too. How many of you remember that? Just it was just a few weeks ago, I think, that Anonymous released a na uh, a list of the names of I think it was police officers and politicians with ties to the KKK, mm -hmm. who donated that before. This is real identities being tied to a donation to the KKK or to uh, you know attending meetings or writing in support stuff like that. So, was that right or wrong? To release it. Um, to release it. And we're coming back to that line of did physical violence actually happen? Before that line, there's some excuse afterwards, there's not an excuse. Hang on for one second. Go ahead. From a lawyer standpoint, I would mm -hmm. say it goes against our constitutional values mm -hmm. in America. But constitutional values? So there's a right to privacy in the uh, Constitution? There, there is. As horrible and disgusting as a human being that you might be, I think that's something that makes America. Go find the place in the Constitution where the right to privacy is enshrined. That's about to be your exercise at the end of this lecture, by the way. What are getting taken away? First, first mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between having a, mm -hmm. what people would call a shitty opinion, or, yeah. or, being a, or being a criminal. Terrible opinion. It's a horrible that's, opinion. That's, that's <laughs> I don't like your opinion. Oh, wait, that encapsulates about 97% of the internet. I don't <laughs> like you. Well, Someone's wrong on the internet. Where does your statements have their information yeah. Okay, the assertion that a registered Satanist sacrifices animals might be one that I don't necessarily want to m make. I have no idea. I don't know how Satanists practice their religion, and I don't really care. Some. Okay, what's that? Some, some do sacrifice. <laughs> I'm going to go with don't hurt humans. And other than that, I don't much care. I, if you want to see a great demonstration of how to do your religion, go to that oatmeal comic. Um, what is it? Uh, somebody look it up and put it on random or on general, which is how to do your religion right. I think I, I, it's, it's the greatest comic I've ever seen, which is basically, look, try to help people. Don't be an asshole. Your question. Um, I was going to say it would depend on how they released it and the reasons. That's fair. Because, like, releasing it on one point could be a privacy thing. Because people, yeah. like, even though it's right to release it in their mind, they're like, but I don't want them to release my secrets, so it's wrong. Yes. And then, well, and that's always the case, right? Yeah. You, you want other people to face the consequences of their actions, yeah. but you actually want a little bit of mercy and understanding for the things that you've done in your life. This is one of the reasons why I like to try not to judge people, because, oh, dear God. <laughs> yes. Um, also, like... <laughs> what if they were releasing it in order to protect something because they had True. information on they were going to now act on this. These are yes. the people that are now doing this. But what we're doing then is is we start to delve into the whys and wherefores there. What we're starting to do is, is move away from the question of why someone would hide themselves on the Internet. And that's the first piece of this, which is the identities. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess we need to move now into, into what's happening as a result of that. So what are we not seeing as a result of people hiding? I, I'm very interested in the stuff that's not there, places that there should be something there, where there's no there there, right? And one of the reasons why is that quote from Marion Wright Edelman yesterday, which is, if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? I'm, I'm interested in that question for a lot of reasons. Do you understand why it's a fascinating question, to look for the thing that doesn't show up? First, it expands your mind out into this, into this way of, of um, of brainstorming that makes you sometimes just have really great ideas out of the middle of nowhere. And second of all, when you try to see what's not there, when you ask yourself what kind of person isn't showing up here, often you identify a problem space that's really interesting. When you look at Stack Overflow and see the tiny minority of women on that site, what do you see? If you're, if you're not looking for anything, you don't see a problem until you see the problem and then you can't not see the problem, right? Does that make sense? When you see the problem, then all of a sudden you can't not see it. People that don't really pay attention to the homelessness problem in Seattle, it's because they don't have to see it. 
I, I just had this great conversation today about somebody who wasn't noticing one of the issues that I was noticing in technology. And he said, no one ever made me see it before, but now I can't not see it. I said, that's what happens when you have your eyes open to something interesting like this. When you get your eyes open to the, the kind of privacy enhancing measures that um, some government and corporations are involved in, which are less than enhancing of our privacy, all of a sudden you start to understand information that could be going somewhere but isn't, or might be going somewhere and you don't know whether it is or not, starts to become really interesting. So what are some other problems with having these identities not show up on the internet, especially on the internet? Background searches. Why is background searches really interesting to you folks? It's, it's been a really interesting question to me too. When you look for someone, don't pretend you haven't Googled yourself on the internet before. And if you're not, you should be doing it like once a month anyway. What do you find when you look yourselves up on the internet? Do you find a whole picture of yourself as a person? You may find bits and pieces of your name tags that you've been using. Bits and pieces. Interesting. Only what you decide to share. Only what you decide to share. Well, now there's an interesting piece too. Yes? That's not always true because sometimes people can decide to share mm -hmm. you on the internet. So it's stuff yes, they can. What I mean is what you have and haven't typed up on the internet. Mm -hmm. So. So when you find yourself on the internet, what are you glad that's being shared and sad that's not being shared? Your accomplishments. Your accomplishments. Why don't your accomplishments show up? Unless you post it. On Unless you post it. Oh, I've got a relative that just posted this total humble brag on Facebook, and it's irritating the crap the crap out of me right now. Yeah, and I'm like, really, really? Do do we need do we need to know that? Okay, that's fine. Sorry, everyone I'm ever related to ever distant relatives where. Um, so <laughs> see, you always have to be careful, right? You always have to edit yourself a little bit. And maybe that's what's interesting, that it's the edited, the curated version of yourself that shows up on the internet. Unless you've got somebody that really doesn't like you and they're posting crap about you on Facebook or other websites. I know people that have had other people buy um, one-off domain names of someone's name and post horrible things about them on the internet. So, and you can't get rid of that. It becomes a citation source for people can't control what somebody's got on a different server than yours, right? And there's usually very few legal remedies for it. It's a very interesting problem, this, this problem of fake or curated identity on the internet. So now that you think about it and you say to yourself, I'm not being seen as a whole person on the internet, does that tell you that maybe everyone else is not also? Remember, this is closely related to that, I want everyone else to face the consequences of their actions, but I'd like a little mercy since everyone should understand what the circumstances were for me. So if you're not being seen as a whole person on the internet, neither is anyone else. I I've met quite a few people at this point who have really big internet presences, and they're often very little like what you would assume they would be like on the internet, right? You know, I, 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 I'm always surprised, and yet I shouldn't be surprised. But they're smart. They're but they're very smart, yeah, sure. No. We always curate. So. There's two different ways, and this is the last part of this, that we can fix this problem, or, or even, I mean, I'm not sure if you all even acknowledge it as a problem. When I say a problem, I more talk about an interesting question space that I like to, to ask questions in. I see people trending in the kind of Zuckerbergian direction of everything we are and everything we should be should be an avatar of us on the internet such that our reputation is tied to us and our, there are real consequences to real actions with our real identities on the internet. And there's an entirely other trend which says there should be no consequences because the things you create on the internet are, pff, they're digital, they're, they're smoke, they don't actually exist. So no consequence should tie itself to you in real life. I would love to hear thoughts on both sides of that argument. Yes? Sounds like liberals versus conservatives. It does, I can understand the idea that it sounds like liberals and conservatives, but I think in this case it's really more just a binary between two different positions. And, and tying it to politics isn't necessarily accurate because there are people on both sides of both of those political spectra that, that think of this problem differently. So it, this, this, is, this is definitely a binary, a split in the road when it comes to our identities on the internet, but it's less tied, I think, to political stances. Yes. I, I think it's just frustrating from experience mm -hmm. that you submit all of your information in good faith when you fill out a background check, and then two years later 
Oh, the OPM hack? Oh, I've got a good friend that just got hacked in that, yeah. yeah. That was me too. Were you, did you get an OPM letter today? Yeah. I've got, like, like half my friends are on Facebook today, like, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty horrifying. And what else is frustrating is you have to fill out this paperwork for a background check when the NSA has all of that. Why can't they just provide the service for you? If they're going to take all your information, why can't they just fill How? out your form for you? No. But, but do you really want to turn over basically everything you are to a single entity that can't figure out a way to get you your driver's license within six weeks? Well, I hate filling out that stuff too. That's why I started a company that fills out all that crap for you, but I have accountability to a customer base that a government doesn't have, right? So there are private solutions to the problem that you're talking about as paperwork gets crazier and crazier and crazier. I am hesitant. Um, to give it to a, a, an organization that is less than nimble because that means that as bad as something gets, it always gets worse with more hands on it and lack of revenue as an incentive to fix the problem, right? And I think it was, go ahead and then we'll have this one, go. I was just going to point out, mm -hmm. um, for background checks, the reason why they request all the information even though they already have it is because they have to cross-reference it to make sure there's no changes that maybe they missed or to make sure it's mm -hmm. you because they don't want to release it unless it's actually you. Well, uh, let, let's stick to kind of the broader question of whether or not it's a good idea to have your identity be singular and tied to you as a real person on the internet or whether or not it should be something that's throwaway, that you can create throwaway identities that, that don't really touch you, that you should be able to shield yourself with anonymity on the internet. Which is better, anonymity or reputation? That's really the question. On Hang on, we got Jonathan, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, uh, I mean, like, the government is behind the times, but I think this year I mean, they're trying to push a lot mm -hmm. more for security. And randomly, I, mm -hmm. when I was on vacation, I talked to this girl who she's doing scans for, like, data security within the government. And I do think that there are things out there that they're trying to secure more, and, I mean, just in general, like, embedding encryption. And it takes time, mm -hmm. especially for someone that's so behind. And I've, I've worked with some government folks before doing, you know, uh, um, consulting and stuff like that. And, and it's, it's very hard to get an organization that does a budgetary on a biannual basis. I mean, this is a budget that gets done every two years. You know, there's an annual budget, the biannual budget, there's multiple plans and stuff like that. But um, most, as far as I'm aware, most organizations in government run on a one or two year budget plan. And trying to get an organization like that to respond to changes that happen in a matter of minutes on the internet for code changes to get them to, to buy into releases is um, it's problematic. So do you think that as like millennials or other people mm -hmm. who get into um, government I think it's a wonderful question and I think that you as a millennial should get your ass elected someplace. Go. Because the answer to that question is only if you get elected, only if you care enough to make a change. So go do it. Go run for office. If an 18-year-old kid can run for mayor of wherever the hell in Wisconsin, you can get elected. Go do it. You know, Tell everybody, I've got 30,000 Instagram followers. Clearly, I understand the internet. Elect me, and I'll make budgeting happen. I'd vote for that. I, mean, I wouldn't vote for that like off. I'd kind of vote for that. You know, th that would be awesome, right? There's, there's a way to make it work and a way to, to have a voice in the conversation, and I would love to see you have one. So go do it. Yeah, don't just ask if it's possible. Try it and see what happens. Right? Yes. So I was um, going to point out, I think mm -hmm. both are necessary just because... That's a great way to put it. Right. Something you just mentioned in your topic, go mm -hmm. try and see if it's possible. A lot yes. of the times you want to be able to try things without really putting yourself at risk. So you need the mm -hmm. anonymity in order to test things and further mm -hmm. expand it without the threat of, I guess you could say, the norm destroying mm -hmm. you because you're testing something new. That is a great way to put it. I do, I do like both of those options. I think that there should be both the capacity to, if you should so choose, tie yourself to a reputation like that, and also to be anonymous to try things out. However, remember that the, the power of anonymity is that there aren't consequences tied to your actions. And one of the reasons why people are good people is because there's consequences tied to their actions. Anonymity is a good thing in theory. Anonymity is a good thing in practice most of the time. And it does give people that freedom to develop their characters, to try out new ideas. But it also is a tool, just like everything else is. It's, anonymity is not good or bad. Reputation is not good or bad. It depends on what you do with it as a tool, right? So 
when we look at tools, one of the things that we say is, is this a tool that can be popularly used without hurting lots and lots and lots of people or giving someone inordinate power to hurt way more people than one person should be able to hurt. It's one of the reasons why we don't distribute nuclear weapons on people's 16th birthdays, although we distribute driver's licenses. Because how many people can you really kill with a car? Four, right? And the probability of that is very low. And yet with a nuclear weapon, if you operate it incorrectly, a single person would have the power to kill millions, correct? Okay, so what we do is we look at tools like that and we say we reserve tools for the people that have proven themselves capable of using them. And yet, interestingly enough, how do you prove yourself capable of using anonymity without reputation? A clean record. A clean record, but then who's certifying you as the person who should be able to use anonymity as a tool to develop yourself? This is a really interesting question. Isn't this a really interesting question? Because this is going to matter more and more and more. Your credit score is starting to get tied to your online reputation. This is not a trivial question. This affects your mortgage payments in 10 years, people. Oh, yeah, that guy. Mm -hmm. And the, that, yeah, that is, yeah. Wendell Pierce was in Hackers as the, the cop, yeah, that got hacked. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah. Greatest movie ever. So, new favorite student. All right. Any last thoughts, any questions about this idea and why it's an important one to talk about? We're going to talk tomorrow about how not to be a troll, but really what that's going to be about is how to build your reputation, how to be somebody that people will come to, and how to specialize in topics. This is, again, um, the week that we talk about how to talk about social issues and technology such that if you wish to, you can go into speaking about social issues and technology with some degree of knowledge and capacity. It's a really important one. I'm glad you all jumped kind of in on the, the questions on this one. Last thoughts, questions? Okay.